Hi everybody, I'm Rob Edwards from Flinders University, and I'm here to tell you about some phages. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, the traditional custodians of the land on which I stand. And I'd like to acknowledge their leaders, both past, present, and emerging. Now, I'm gonna tell you about some work that we've been doing with IBD. In my group, we develop bioinformatics tools for both phage and microbial genomes, and we also do culturing and analysis of both phage and genomes and sequencing their genomes. But what I want to tell you about today is IBD. And so um, IBD is a collective term for um, inflammatory diseases, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. They're separate diseases, they have separate pathologies, um, and they have separate effects. They have separate microbiology too. And when we look at the microbiology, and this was a, a principal component plot of a typical bacterial data set that you would see from somebody with either a healthy person, somebody with ulcer ulcerative colitis, or somebody with Crohn's disease, we always see the signature separation of the different disease states. And our hypothesis is that this is driven by phages. Now, just wanna remind you that phages are viruses that infect and kill bacteria. They're pretty simple things. They're DNA surrounded by protein. And I'm gonna talk about the cordovirales, which are the tailed phages that use this long tail to enable them to attach to the bacterial surface. Now, in some previous work, my collaborators, Scott Hanley, Dave Wang, and others at Washington University in St. Louis, looked at the cordovirales in IBD. And what they found is that if you compare the number of phages that you see across different samples, you see more, so higher richness, of phages either in ulcerative colitis or in Crohn's disease. When they looked at the specific taxa they could recover, they found a lot of taxa in common between all three states, but they found this massive expansion so that you have many more taxa that are present um, in either disease states. If you look at the household controls, there are very few phages that are unique to those household controls. So in our latest study, we aim to collect samples from patients as they have a flare of IBD, and we're gonna collect samples every month for about six months. And then we're gonna taper off, and over the next 18 months or so, we'll collect our samples every three to six months. And most importantly, when you're working with samples from patients, especially fecal samples, as we heard um, from Sam, is you need to consider getting controls from the same place. And so we're getting household controls, so people that live with our cases, to use as controls for these data sets. So that's the theory. In principle, we started off with a big bang, we were doing really well, we were collecting samples, and we actually collected several samples from patients as they were going through the flare and as they were coming out of it. But then, of course, over the last year or so, we've really been unable to collect very many samples, but we're happy to report that that collection is back up. We have a group of samples where we have patients at different conditions. And so, in total, we have about 500 or so samples that we've sequenced, virome samples from different patients, either um, with the healthy household controls, with Crohn's disease, or with ulcerative colitis. And we have about equal number of samples between um, males and females. So, what happens to the phages during IBD? And I'm gonna tell you three different stories. I'm gonna start by telling you about some work we've done, some isolate phages. 
And then I'll tell you about some work we've done on some previously identified phages. And then I'm going to tell you about some work we've done with metagenome assembled genomes. So we've been isolating phages against bacteria that either commonly grow in the gut or that we've isolated from our fecal samples. And we have a collection of phage isolates against different bacteria, Bacteroides fragilis, Bacteroides cellulidicus, E. coli, um, some eubacterium, some clostridium phages, and some phages against bacteria that we haven't yet figured out what they are. And as we heard so eloquently from Graham Hatful, what we find is that um, phages from within a group of bacteria, in this case, Bacteroides cellulidicus, are more similar to each other than they are to phages from other bacteria. So we can take these phages and we can interrogate them by asking how abundant are they in our metagenomes. And so on this graph, I've plotted the, the log of the reads that are mapped to each phage genome, but I've normalized it by the size of the metagenome. So that's reads mapped per million bases sequenced. And I've also normalized it by the size of the phage. And so that's reads mapped per million bases sequenced per kilobase of phage DNA. And in each of these plots that I'll show you, we have phages along the bottom. And in blue, we have samples from patients with Crohn's disease. In green, we have samples from patients with ulcerative colitis. And in brown, we have the healthy household controls. We can take this information and we can put it into machine learning tools, like for example, a random forest, and we can say, how good are these phages at predicting or identifying whether you have a disease or whether you're healthy? And you may see something like this random, this, uh, random forest variable importance plot that says this particular phage is really important at predicting whether you're diseased or healthy. In this case, it turns out the most important phage, of course, is Krauss phage. We don't know why that is at the moment. It's something that we're still really trying to figure out and explore about what's going on. So what about other previously identified phages? So hopefully you saw this lovely paper from the Lawley group that was published earlier this year. And in this paper, they cr created a phage genome database from all of the metagenomes that they could find, about 30,000 metagenomes. A huge amount of work. They identified 142,000 non-redundant phages. And in the paper, they describe host assignments. I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, they describe the epidemiology of these phages, and they describe some new clades that they discovered as well. And so we can take these 142,000 phages, and we can plot them the same way that I've just showed you, the same normalization on the y-axis and the phages along the x-axis. Now, obviously, I can't plot all 142,000 phages along the x-axis. I've plotted about 10 here for you to see. But I think what you can see is that in this data set, there's a massive expansion of phages in either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So yet again, we see a big expansion of phages in disease. We don't know why that's happening. As I mentioned, one of the advantages of this data set is that they've assigned hosts to each of these sequences, or as well as they can. Um, I've also added a couple of other host prediction tools. I use the CRISPR OpenDB tool to predict host, and another tool that we've developed called RAFA, um, both of which have been published uh, this year. And you can see that for a few other phages, we can identify the host. So for example, this phage um, appears to infect a bilophila. We can identify phages that infect Clostridium. 
and appear to be important in predicting host uh, health or disease. And then we've also identified some phages where we're not really sure exactly what they infect. They may infect a couple of different hosts, one, one host or another. And then, of course, we find a lot of phages where we have no idea what it infects, and yet it seems to be important in health and disease. One of the other things to note when we look at these phage genomes is what their genomes look like. And so we can look at the phage genes and say, do you look like a known phage gene? And most of the time, of course, they, they really do. Most of the genes that we find in phages are just hypothetical proteins. And so in my group and in others as well, we're really interested in trying to understand this viral dark matter. What are these phages doing? What are these genes doing in these phages? Okay, so we've looked at isolate phages. We've looked at some previously identified phages. What about some metagenome assembled genomes? So we took our metagenomes from all of those patients I showed you. We did the same thing. We assembled them. We used some uh, binning characteristics to bin them together based on coverage and based on composition and things like that. And we get metagenome assembled genomes back. And we can do the same kind of analysis. Here I've plotted metagenome assembled genomes against normalized recounts, just the way that you've seen before. And again, you can see there's a massive expansion in phages in either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Now, it's not always true. There are some phages that are more prevalent in healthy household controls. That's what we would expect. But in many cases, we see more phages in the disease state than in the healthy state. We can use these data to um, ask whether the patients are more similar to their healthy household controls than they are to other patients. Um, and we can um, ask what's happening with these metagenome assembled genomes. I wanted to leave you with one last thought, which is what would be better to understand? Is it better to understand the metagenome assembled genomes that come from our um, metagenomes we've sequenced, or we've sequenced our viruses, or phages from the gut phage database. The gut phage database has 150,000 phages. It's vast. It was an awful lot of effort to put that together. It's terrific that it's available. But we know so little about the phages in our guts that it's still not as predictive as doing de novo metagenomics, assembling phage genomes, and then interrogating them based on the samples that we see. And so what we have here are two TSNES. On the left, we have the phage database, and on the right, we have the metagenome assembled genomes. And you can see that the TSNE class is so much better when we use the metagenome assembled genomes than when we use the phage database. So even though we have this huge database, we know so little about the bacteria in our guts that creating our own genomes, even though there's a lot of problems with that, um, is much more predictive. So what I've told you today is that there's a massive expansion of phages during IBD. We don't yet know why that's happening. We don't know if it's a cause or an effect. I've told you that CRAS phage is an important signal. Of course it is. And we should all be studying CRAS phage. And I've also told you that metagenome assembled genomes from patients are much more predictive um, than using the gut phage database. Even though the gut phage database has such a vast number of phages, there's still so much we don't know. I'd like to thank my collaborators in this project. Scott Hanley and Dave Wang from Washington University in St. Louis, Anka Segal from San Diego State, and Liz Dinsdale here at Flinders University. 
Um, and although we like to take all of the credit, of course, we aren't the people that do all of the work. And I'd like to thank our amazing team for all of the efforts that we've put into understanding IBD. And I'd also like to thank the National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases for financial support for this work. And I'd like to thank you for watching. And like you, I'm bummed that we're not in Victoria this week, and I am really looking forward to the next time that we can get together and meet in person. Thank you so much.